Excellent! So yesterday this tiny little box arrived and in it was the new Intel Core i7-6950X, their 10 core, 20 thread, newest and fastest consumer grade CPU that they have ever produced. Uh, it is part of the Broadwell E family, it's built on the 14 nanometer lithography and there are actually four new CPUs in this family but I'm going to be concentrating on the 6950X today. More on the other CPUs in just a little bit. Speaking of everything else, I was delivered the CPU with probably about 48 hours between when I got it and when I'm leaving for Computex. So I spent a lot of time last night running some benchmarks and to speed things up I'm going to jump right into the benchmarks then we'll talk about some more of the features and technology. Okay, one spec you should keep in mind as we look at benchmarks is the price. The bulk price is $1,723, which means it's probably gonna retail for more than that, $1,750 to $1,800. So bear that in mind. But I'm gonna be comparing this to the 5960X, and the only 5960X that I have is back in the Arctic Panther back there. Now, I wanted to run it at stock speed to give a more apples to apples comparison, but Arctic Panther just wouldn't let me underclock it. It's, 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 it wouldn't let me, I tried. So as a result, you'll be seeing the 6950X at stock. You'll also be seeing the 6950X overclocked to 4.3 gigahertz across all 10 cores. That's about a 43% overclock. I did try for 4.5 like the Arctic Panther is, but it just wouldn't hold it. Even 4.4 was a bit unstable, so I stuck with 4.3. And to proceed with the benchmarking, I set up a mini little test bed here. Now, if you're thinking of a video I posted just a few days ago where I built a brand new test bed with an X99 motherboard, and you're like, Paul, why didn't you use that? Well, the weird thing about when I film this and when I film that is I have, I have I haven't done that yet. You've seen that, but I haven't done it. It's a weird, anyway, time, time is timey-wimey, but this is the test bed I'm using for these specific tests, and I'll be using that test bed that I built when I get back from Computex. But this is based on the X99A Gaming Pro Carbon motherboard from MSI. Uh, very similar to the Godlike, but much less expensive, thank God. Uh, it's also got the Plextor M6E uh, SSD in there just to give us some high speed fast storage. G Skill Trident Z, their new series of memory. I have the black and white version here. It's available in different colors. And this is actually the 3200 speed rated memory kit, although I was running it at 2666 to match the speed of the Arctic Panther, at least when it was overclocked. When I was running stock, it was just running at 2133. I have the Enermax ETS T40 CPU cooler in black with the Scythe Gentle Typhoon fan on top. And then, of course, I have power supply in my EVGA Supernova 750 G. 280 plus gold rated power supply to get everything power. Now, I'm not really doing much on the GPU side here, but I did pop in the uh, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080 just so it could be there and look pretty. Now, if you're thinking about this platform, X99 LGA 2011-3 socket, you're probably going to do some heavy lifting with it. So I'm going to start off with some video benchmarks, specifically rendering video in Adobe Premiere Creative Cloud. This is rendering out 4K footage in H.264 format, and I was actually pretty surprised that Arctic Panther, with its overclock, managed to beat the 6950X at its stock frequency. Now granted, there's a pretty wide variance there because the 6950X, when it's running on all cores, it can't even get to its turbo boost 3.5. That's only if it's running on a single core. So it was running at 3 gigahertz most of the time, so that shows where the Arctic Panther had the advantage. When overclocked though, the 6950X really started to tear through the render, got the time down to 2 minutes and 47 seconds, a 19% improvement over the stock frequency. Next up is Handbrake. I was using this to transcode or take 4K video and render it down to 1080 format so you could take something and put it on a cell phone for example. And here again we saw the Arctic Panther beat out the 6950X when it was running at stock speed. In fact, 6950X uh, performance here was a little bit disappointing, but again I'm comparing it to a very heavily overclocked 5960X. Again, when overclocked, the 6950X really started to show its strength and performance, and it got that render time cut more than in half, down to 3 minutes and 6 seconds, a 53% improvement, and of course, handily beating Arctic Panther at that point. Next up is Cinebench. This is more of a synthetic benchmark, but I ran this in both multi-threaded mode as well as single-threaded mode. In multi-threaded mode, with all 10 cores and 20 threads going, the 6950X beat Arctic Panther even at the stock frequency, just running at 3 GHz, and uh, when it was overclocked, wow, a very nice performance improvement indeed. Jumped up to 2197 on the score, a 24% improvement. I then switched over to single thread. This was run very quickly, but I wanted to try to get a bit of a direct performance single thread to single thread. And Broadwell E definitely provides some single threaded performance improvements. We had a 10.6 improvement going from the uh, standard clock to the overclock on the 6950X. And if you compare the 5960X on Arctic Panther overclock to the 6950X overclock, that's a 31% improvement. And that's not even running at the same frequency. 
After that, we tried out Blender. This is a flying squirrel 3D rendering job that it runs through fairly quickly. It only takes about 20 to 25 seconds. And again, here we saw the same story. The 6950X at stock can't beat the overclock 5960X, but again, when overclocked, we saw a very nice performance improvement. Jumped down beneath the 20 second mark, and that gave 21% improvement over the stock frequency. Finally, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the Ida 64 cache and memory suite. We saw a pretty nice performance improvement when it comes to memory write speeds as well as a drop in latency. Other than that, those scores are pretty much the same. So I hope you guys enjoyed those benchmarks. I have a couple more stats to share. As far as power draw goes, this entire little getup here was drawing just shy of 200 watts when it was at stock frequency. When I overclocked though, it jumped up the power draw pretty significantly and went up to about uh, 330 to 340. So it was a good 130, 140 watt additional power draw. Again, talking about peak power draw overall. Uh, as far as temperatures go though, again at stock, really, really low temperatures. I mean, I don't know if that was our Animax uh, cooler here, or just the fact that the 6950X Broadwell E is pretty efficient, but uh, only peaked at about 47 degrees Celsius, which isn't too bad at all. Again, when overclocked, that's gonna draw more power, create more heat, so it got all the way up to about 80, um, although it didn't get too much beyond that. When I did attempt the 4.4 gigahertz overclock, it was actually drawing about uh, 1.45 uh, volts, which is more than you'd want on the CPU. So it did get well above 90 there. I think I actually hit TDP max. But fortunately, dialing that back a little bit and running at about 1.39 volts is what I was doing for the 4.3 gigahertz overclock. It was pretty stable and I didn't have too many issues. A few more stats for the 6950X. You have 25 megabytes of shared cache and it is very fast shared cache if you checked out the ID64 benchmarks. It also has 140 watt TDP, so it's sticking with the same TDP as the 5960X. And a nice addition for the Broadwell E family is it gives you native Thunderbolt 3 support. That's 40 gigabytes per second bi-directional bandwidth. So for those of you external storage hogs, Thunderbolt 3 is the way to go. Now let's take a look at some of the specs and details for all of the CPUs in the new Broadwell E launch lineup. We have, of course, the 6950X at, at the top. Also the 6900K, which has kind of taken the place of the 5960X more so since it's still eight core, uh, 16 thread, and costs around $1,000 or $1,100. Uh, the 6850K is gonna be your six core, 12 thread, uh, still has all 40 PCI Express lanes, and that's gonna be kind of your 5930K replacement. And then finally, we also have the 6800K for the folks who are just trying to get onto this platform. You are cut down to 28 PCIe lanes again, which is very similar to the 5820K that we saw from last generation. Base clocks are all in the low three gigahertz range and boost clocks will go up to 3.5 on the 6950X, 3.7 on the 6900K. And bear in mind, those are single core overclock numbers. So if you really want the maximum performance out of these, you gotta take advantage of the fact that they are unlocked. Use your overclocking techniques to get all of the cores running at higher frequencies, and especially on multi-threaded applications, you'll see a big performance improvement. As for cache, you get 25 megabytes on the 6950X, 20 on the 6900K, 15 on the 6850K, and also 15 on the 6800K. One last thing here is that the DDR4 standard has been bumped up a little bit, so the standard for these CPUs Oh, my, my system just went to sleep here. That's okay, I'll wake it back up later. The standard for these CPUs though is DDR4-2400. Of course, they can still run at 2133 just fine, but that is, you know, nice little bump. Finally, the pricing, and this is probably the biggest sticking point for most people. Again, that 6900K really taking the place of the, of the 5960X when it comes to the price layout and you're really gonna have to pay a significant premium if you want that 10 core CPU, $1,723, and that's if you buy a thousand of them. Um, if you're buying them individually, my guess is uh, $1,750 to $1,800 each for the 6950X. A couple more features to round things out. We have an AVX ratio offset that allows the CPU to run at a slightly underclocked frequency if it detects it's running an AVX, AVX instruction set since they can be finicky. They've also added VCCU voltage control for you higher end overclockers out there. And finally, a pretty exciting feature called Turbo Boost Max 3.0. Now, Turbo Boost 2.0 still works, and the Turbo Boost frequencies I've been talking about still apply to that. Turbo Boost Max 3.0 is basically specific to a single thread CPU overclocking. So they want to give the Broadwell E family of processors more bang for the buck, I suppose, especially when you're talking about non multi threaded applications. So it will actually detect which core in the CPU can run the fastest 
and it can assign that core specifically to run a single application and there's a little application you can go to set it up and do everything. Again, I was limited on time so I didn't get to do too much with that, but it does exist and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of pretty cool tests with that coming out very soon. So let's do a bit of a conclusion here. The pros about the 6950X are hopefully, obviously, it's insanely fast. It's very, very fast, and it's without a doubt the fastest CPU at the consumer level that Intel has ever given us access to. It's also pretty power efficient from what I can tell. I liked the low temperatures when it was running at stock speed specifically. Also doesn't seem to be too bad of an overclocker. Granted, I'm using a very limited sample size since I only have this single CPU, but 4.3 gigahertz across all 10 cores, that's pretty impressive. I'll also quickly mention that Turbo Boost Max 3.0 technology since it just kind of seems to make sense, especially for a massive multi-core CPU kind of like this. Again, I didn't get to test that directly, but assuming it works like they're saying, it does seem like a pretty cool feature. As far as cons go, well, uh, it's really, really expensive. Like, it's out of the ballpark of most people. $1,000 is out of the range for most people building a system, but there are gonna be enthusiasts and people who have to have the best of the best and people who just have a little bit more money in their pocket who are gonna be able to buy this processor. But for a lot of people, it's just gonna be watching videos like this that gives you a little bit of a taste of the performance. So I hope I have provided you guys with a little, little bit of that today. The only other con I can think of is like, I don't know, maybe there could have been some other fancy, amazing technology. I mean, the Turbo Boost Max 3.0 is kind of cool, but I don't know, if it suddenly had more PCIe lanes or something like that, that, that might've been cool, but maybe that's hard to implement since they're still using the same X99 chipset the same LGA 2011-3 socket. So you do have the backwards compatibility with existing motherboards, as long as you get a BIOS update for them, or the entire range of new motherboards, since as you may have noticed, a lot of motherboard manufacturers are coming out with new motherboards right now. But that is all for this video, guys. I really hope you have enjoyed it. I'm Paul with Paul's Hardware, and hit the thumbs up button. If you liked this video, leave me a comment down in the comment section below, and let me know what you think of this processor. Let me know if you're gonna buy one. If any of you guys are like, yes, I don't care what it costs, I'm gonna get one right when it comes out. Thanks again for watching guys and we'll see you next time.